and so the doughty Mr. Shawin and I proceeded through the hot and inexhaustible desert. As we proceeded south from Dali waters, the landscape became more sparsely vegetated. It began to feel eerily as if we had left planet Earth. The soil took on a reddish glow, more Martian than terrestrial, and the sunlight seemed to double in intensity as if generated by a nearer, larger sun. Even on a smoothly paved highway, in the comfort of air conditioning, you are not entirely robbed of the sense of what the explorers must have gone through. The discomforts can't be fully imagined, but the scale can, and it was awesome. To the left were several thousand square miles of stubbled no nothingness called the Barclay Tableland, which eventually merges into the Simpson Desert. Simpson Desert, probably the toughest ranching country in the world. So unyielding is the land that ranches, ranches have to be vast to support a single operation. The largest of them at a place called Anna Creek is bigger than Belgium. To the right, unbelievably, the land was even harsher. This was the infamous Tanami Desert, an area of hellish dryness that even now is largely uncharted. On my map, not the feature was indicated, not a dried creek bed or old dirt truck, for 300 miles to the western Australia border. Beyond that, it was virtually as bleak for 600 miles more. Even among the Stewart Highway, with its life-bearing traffic, the 550-odd miles between Dali Waters and Alice Springs could boast just one small town, an old gold mining community called Tennant Creek, three or four clustered habitations that made Dali Waters look cosmopolitan and the roadhouse perhaps once every 80 miles and that was it i had never been out in such a boundless blank eventually some hills began to rise in the middle middle distance the mcdonnell ranges very occasionally once or twice an hour a road train would bomb fast bomb past once we saw an approaching car, the driver evidently sedated by monotony, leave the road and bang wildly along the rough shoulder for perhaps 200 feet, pulling in his wake a long speed ramp of pulling in his wake a long speed ramp of dust. As he neared us, Starred possibly by Alan's honking, the driver jerked to startled wakefulness and veered reflexively, but much too sharply for the pavement and hence and thence to our shrill amazement into a path. It was absurd in an area of inaccessible inexpressible emptiness the only two pieces of moving metal were about to bang together in a very big way there passed an instant made up in equal parts of horn blare muted shrieks and wild tight swerves for the strangest moment time went into a rest and i could see par perfectly our unwitting assailant, frozen as if in a candid photograph, looking at us with a mixture of bewilderment and apology. I shouldn't wonder 
that it's a moment all people are given when they are about to die suddenly. Then all was blurred swiftness again. The cars passed without hitting, goodness knows how, and I turned full in the seat to watch our adversary shooting away into the distance behind us, soberly attentive to his lane. I watched until he was a dot at vanishing point, then turned to Alan. Well, I don't know about you, he said brightly, but I'm ready for a cup of coffee and a change of underpants. Excellent plan, I agreed, and I joined him in scanning the horizon for a lonely but welcoming roadhouse. The great virtue about driving through a great deal of emptiness is that when you come to anything, anything at all that might be called a diversion, you get disproportionately excited. In mid-afternoon, we saw a signpost for something called the Devil's Marbles, and with the briefest exchange of glances, followed a side road a mile or so to a parking area. And there we saw something really quite fabulous. Enormous piles of smooth granite boulders, many as big as houses, stacked in jumbled piles or scattered over an immense area, 1800 hectares according to a signboard. Every one brought to mind something else, a jelly bean a bread roll, a bowling ball, except that they were immense and often perched on impossibly fine points. Imagine a boulder maybe 30 feet high and nearly spherical standing on a base little larger than say a manhole cover. Needless to say, there wasn't a soul around. Put these stones anywhere in Europe or North America and they would be world famous. In every family album would be a photograph of mom and the kids having a picnic against the backdrop of fantastic rocks. Here they were a lost, lost wonder of the road in the middle of a boundless nowhere. We wandered around for half an hour as amazed by the solitude as much as by the rocks, then congratulated ourselves on our good fortune and good sense in stopping, and returned to the road in a state of elevated contentment. Ten hours and 903 kilometers after leaving Dali waters, we arrived dry and dusty in Alice Springs, a grid of ruler straight streets set like an enormous helipad on a plain beside the golden slopes of the McDonnell Ranges. Because it is so bang in the middle of nowhere, Alice Springs ought to seem a miracle. An actual town with department stores and schools and streets with names and for a long time it was a sort of antipodian Timbuktu, a place tantalizing in its inaccessibility. In 1954, when Alan Moore had head, Alan Moorehead passed through, Alice's only regular connection to the outside world was a weekly train from Adelaide. Its arrival on Saturday evening was the biggest event in the life of the town. It brought mail, newspaper, new pictures from for the cinema, long-awaited spare parts, and whatever else couldn't be acquired locally. Nearly the whole town turned out to see who got off and what was unloaded. In those days, 
Alice had a population of 4,000 and hardly any visitors. Today, it's a thriving little city with a population of 25,000 and it is full of visitors, 350,000 of them a year, which is, of course, the whole problem. These days, you can jet in from Adelaide in two hours, from Melbourne and Sydney in less than three. You can have a latte and a busy and, and buy some opals and then climb on a tour bus and travel down the highway to Ayers Rock. The town has not only become accessible, it's become a destination. It's so full of motels, hotels, conference centers, campgrounds and desert resorts that you can't pretend even for a moment that you have achieved something exceptional by getting yourself there. It's crazy really. A community that was once famous for being remote now attracts thousands of visitors who come to see how remote it no longer is. Nearly all guidebooks and travel articles indulge the gentle conceit that Alice retains some irreproducible outback charm, some away from it all quality that you must come here to see, but in fact it is anywhere Australia. Actually it is anywhere planet Earth. On our way into town, we passed strip malls, car dealerships, McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken outlets, banks and gas stations. Only a scattering of Aborigines strolling along the dried bed of the Todd River gave any hint of exoticism. We took rooms in the motor inn on the edge of the modest downtown. My room had a balcony where I could watch the setting sun flood the desert floor and burnish the golden slopes of the McDonnell ranges beyond. Or at least I could if I looked past the more immediate sprawl of a Mart Plaza across the road. In the two million or more square miles that is Australian outback, I don't suppose there is a more unfortunate juxt juxtaposition. Alan was evidently held by a similar thought for a half an hour later when we met out front, he was staring at the same scene. I can't believe we've just driven a thousand miles to find a Kmart, he said. He looked at me. You Yanks have a lot to answer for, you know. I started to protest in a sputtering sort of way, but what could I say? He was right. We do. We have created a philosophy of retailing that is totally without aesthetics and totally irresistible. And now we box these places up and ship them to the far corners of the world. Visually, almost every arrestingly regrettable thing in Alice Springs was a product of American enterprise from people for, from people who couldn't know that they had helped to drain the distinctiveness from an outback town and doubtless wouldn't see it that way anymore. Anyway, nor come to that, I dare say, with most of the shoppers of Alice Springs who are no doubt delighted to get lots of free parking and a crack at Martha Stewart towels and shower curtains. What the sad and curious age we live in. We strolled through the center town looking for somewhere to eat. Alice's 
central business district was sufficiently compact that it took little time to exhaust its modest possibilities for sustenance and diversions. When we realized that we were walking the same streets twice, we repaired more or less by default to a Chinese restaurant we had passed a few minutes earlier from the other direction. It was nearly empty. While we waited for our food, Alan gazed critically at the flock wallpaper and gaudy fixtures as if these alone might explain Alice's disappointing inadequacies. For a moment he seemed even to be gazing at the background music. So how long are we here for? he asked at last. Well, we are here tomorrow. And then we go to Ululu, and then we come back here for a day, and then we you fly back to England. He nodded thoughtfully. So two days here altogether. Yep. And what is there to do for two days in Alice Springs? Quite a lot, in fact, I said encouragingly, and pulled out a brochet I had taken from a rack in a motel. I flipped through it. There's the Alice Springs Desert Park, for one thing. He inclined his head a fraction. What's that? It's a nature reserve where they've carefully recreated a desert environment. In the desert? Yes, they've recreated a desert in the desert. Have I got that right? Yes. And you pay money for this? Yes. He nodded contemplatively. What else? I turned the page. The Mecca Date Garden, which is a garden where they grow dates. And they charge money for this as well? I believe so. Is that it or is there more? Oh, much more. I went through the list of their attractions. The old telegraph station, Frontier Camel Farm, Old Timers Folk Museum, National Pioneer Women's Pioneer Women's Hall of Fame, Road Transport Hall of Fame, Minerals House, Chateau Hornsby Winery, Sounds of Starlight Theatre, Street Street. Flow Aboriginal Research Center. Alan listened intently, sometimes requesting a soupçon of elaboration, and considered all this for some moments. Then he said, Let's go to Ayers Rock. I thought for a moment. Yeah, all right, I said. And so in the morning, we rose early and set off for mighty Ululu. Alice Springs could wait. Ululu and Alice Springs are so inextricably linked in the popular imagination that nearly everyone thinks of them as cosily proximate. In fact, it is almost 300 miles across a largely featureless tract to get from the one to the other. Ululu's glory is that it stands alone in the bound, boundless emptiness, but it does mean that you have to really want to see it. It's not something you're going to pass on the way to the beach. That is as it should be, of course, but it is equally a fact that when you have just come you have just completed a thousand mile passage through barren void. You don't really require another five hours of it to confirm your impression that much of central Australia is empty. Well into the 1950s, Ayers Rock was inaccessible to all but the most dedicated sightseers. As late as the late 1960s, the number of annual visitors was no more than 10,000. 
today Bululu gets that many gets that many every 10 days on average. It even has its own airport and the resort that has sprung up to serve it called Yulala is the third largest community in the territory when full. Yulala stands a dis discreet and respectful dozen or so miles from the rock itself, so we stopped there first to get rooms. It consists essentially of a lazy loop road along which are tucked a range of accommodations from campgrounds and the youth hostel up to the most sumptuously deluxe of resort hotels. With nothing better to do, we had passed much of the five-hour drive working out a program for ourselves for a stay. Essentially, this had established that we would spend the afternoon studying the rock in a calm and reflective manner, then divide whatever remained of the day between a cooling dip in the hotel room, drinks on the terrace while watching the setting sun gorge the rock with the red glow for which it is famed, a little stroll through the desert to stretch our legs and look for dingoes, wallabies and kangaroos and finally a dinner of refreshed refinement and quality beneath a sky of twinkling stars. We had, after all, just driven 1300 miles in two and a half days. If ever anyone was entitled to a little desert R and R, it was us. So there was a certain real excitement as we turned off the highway and entered the cosseted confines of Yulala. We went first to the Outback Pioneer Hotel, which sounded moderately priced if dangerously like, likely to have chandeliers made of wagon wheels and an all-you-can-eat buffet for people in baseball caps. In fact, it proved on approach to be rather grand and clearly very nice, but unexpectedly busy. Stacks of luggage were being unloaded from two tour buses out front. Out front. And there were people everywhere, nearly all white-haired and pear-shaped, standing around, squinting or fiddling with cameras and video recorders. Alan dropped me out front and I trotted inside to inquire about rates. I was amazed at the moment of hubbub in the lobby, at the amount of hubbub in the lobby. It was clearly afternoon on a weekday out of season and the place was a circus. The check-in area brought to mind a mustering station of a foundering cruise ship. I asked the guy at the concierge desk what was going on. Nothing in particular, he said, joining me in considering the unattractive chaos. It's always like this. Really? I said. Even out of season? There is no out of season here now. Are there any rooms here, do you know? Afraid not. The only place with rooms left is the desert gardens. I thanked him and heaved back to the car. Problem? Said Alan as I climbed in. Very poor desert very poor desert selection. I said, not wishing to alarm him. Let's try the Desert Gardens Hotel. It's much nicer. The Desert Gardens was vastly more swank than the Pioneer Outback and massively less crowded. Only one person, a man of about 70, stood between me and the check-in clerk. 
I arrived just in time to hear the clerk to say to him, it's $353 a night. I swallowed hard at this. We'll take it, said the man in an American accent. How big is it? I beg your pardon? How big is the room? The clerk looked taken aback. Well, I'm not sure of it sure of its dimensions exactly it's a fair size what's that mean fair size it's amply proportionate proportioned sir would you like to see the room no i want to sign in the man said shortly as if the clerk were needlessly delaying him we want to get to the rock very good sir as he signed in he asked a million subsidiary questions where was the rock exactly how long did it take to get there was there a cocktail lounge in this hotel where was that exactly what time was dinner served could you see the rock from the dining room was it was seen the rock from dining the dining room where was the pool through which windows, which doors, and what about the elevator? Where was that? Where? I looked at my watch unhappily. It was getting on for two o'clock and we didn't even have rooms yet. Time was speeding away. So is it good this rock? The man was saying in what might have been an attempt at levity. I beg your pardon, sir? The rock, is it worth coming all this way? Well, as rocks go, sir, I think you could say it's first class. Yeah, well, well, it better be, the man said darkly. Then his wife joined him, and to my dismay, she began asking questions. Was there a hairdresser's? How late was it open? Where could they mail postcards? Did the gift shop accept travelers' checks? There were U.S. dollars. These are these were U.S. dollars travelers' checks. Was that okay? And how much are postage stamps for America? Is there an iron an ironing board in the room? Where do you say the gift shop is? And what about my brain? <laughs> Have you seen that anywhere? It's about the size of a very small walnut and never been used. Eventually, they shuffled off and the clerk turned to me. With a regretful air, he informed me that the gentleman ahead of me had taken the last room. There might be dormitory space at the youth hostel, he said, and allowed his deeply unappealing propo proposition to sit there for a moment. Shall I check? Yes, please, I murmured. He consulted his computer and looked suitably doleful. No, I'm afraid even that's full now. I'm sorry. I thanked him and went on, went out. Alan was leaning against the car with a hopeful face, which fell when I he saw mine. I explained to him the situation. He looked crushed. So no swim, he said. I nodded. No wine on the terrace, no sunset over the rock, no elegant room with downy pillows, no complimentary fluffy bathrobe and tinkling minibar. The bathrobes never fit anyway, Alan not quite the point he fixed me with a frank gaze and instead of these things we will be driving back to Alice Springs he removed his focus to the wider world while he allowed this thought to settle well he said at last I suppose we'd better go and see if this bloody rock is worth a 600 mile round trip.